Hey y'all, Matt Donald here. So rather than tell you specifically what we're going to talk about this month on the Paleo Bites Patreon at patreon.com slash Matthew Donald, I don't know, it's going to be some Jurassic Park property or some crap. I don't know. I thought instead the best way to advertise this is by playing a clip of last month's episode where I talk about the fever dream that is the Dinoverse books by Scott Simpson. So roll the tape. <laughs> And then she murmurs the line specifically to the GK Acrocanthosaurus. Again, I cannot stress this enough. A normal ass Acrocanthosaurus. So kiss me already. I've only been waiting a hundred million years. What the hell are these books? <laughs> she falls in love with a normal ass Acrocanthosaurus. I'm, I'm so angry and mad about this that I'm mixing up these dinosaurs. And I'm a dinosaur nerd. I never do that. She falls in love with an Acrocanthosaurus and then only agrees to get together with the human that's interested in her when this human is merged with the psyche of that normal ass Acrocanthosaurus. This books are insane. <laughs> ah. <sighs> Anyways, roar, growl. Bellow. Welcome to Paleo Bites, the podcast that drives Pebble to the metal. My name is Matthew Dahl, and each week I and a rotating series of guest co-hosts talk about and rate a genus of prehistoric animal, be it dinosaur, <laughs> mammal, arthropod, and so on. This week I'm joined once again by the esteemed, uh, by the esteemed and authoritarian, not authoritarian, that's a form of bad government, authoritative um, member of Audubon and my dear father, Donald Hall. How are you? I'm doing great today. Oh, that's good. That's good to hear. See, see, like, I remember when we did our first episode, you were a bit, it, it was a bit off, you know, because we were trying to get used to it. But now once you got the vibe going, it's it's, it's fun, isn't it? Like, it's, it's fun. Yeah, it's, yeah it like, is cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. It is cool. Yeah, I'd say it's cool. But, like, we're going to take this seriously, though, because I remember when you were like, hey, can, can I, I want to show this to my Audubon group, but I want you to edit out that roar, growl. I'm like, that's the show. But, okay, we'll do a serious version for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit. I'll, I'll do two versions of the episodes that you're in. One that's, like, the main part of the show. One that's, like, for you and your boring bird friend. That's not true. They're not boring. <laughs> hey, without... Well, birds, but, birds and dinosaurs are one. So yes, they really are. Well, you, you okay. can't be interested in dinosaurs without being interested in birds. Well, it's, it's more like a rectangle square thing. Like all birds are dinosaurs, but not all dinosaurs are birds, though. So a triceratops is not a bird. You mean all birds are dinosaurs, yes. but not all dinosaurs are birds. Yes, so like an ankylosaurus is right. not a bird. That's right. So it's a square rectangle thing. Yes. Uh, so... Uh, but no, we are talking about a bird, though, like very much a bird this time, um, not even a dinosaur like bird, a bird like dinosaur like we did last time with Anzu. This is very much a bird. It's called Eurip, Eurip, Eurypter, Eurypteryx, not to be confused with Eurypterids, which are the name of the sea scorpions. <laughs> Remember Nigel Marvin when he went back in time? Yes, yeah, I and do. He had those sea scorpions those yes. called Eurypterids. Yep. But this is very similar sounding. Eurypteryx. Uh, I mean, it's the broad-billed moa. I think you're a ter pterix means wing. I don't know what Eura means, but I'm just calling it the, the broad-billed moa because that's what's more generic name. Uh, type is a ratite uh, group of birds that includes the modern-day ostriches, emus, and rias. For such a wide-spreading group for flightless birds. Although apparently we think now that the ratites, you know, they all came from flying ancestors that individually learn fl became flightless is that true i think i read about that yes very very much so yeah. so like it's so like the rat tights some flew to africa some flew to australia and some flew to south america and then one by one they all independently evolved flightlessness yep that's yep. incredible so yeah, parallel been, evolution where you have <clears throat> convergent the same evolution. conditions that that right i'm sorry convergent evolution where you have the same conditions that foster uh those kind of traits uh, being being something that is important for survival. Now, are there any modern day flying ratites, or are they all flightless today? I'm not aware of any. Okay, well, interesting. Uh, size two to three feet slash or three point three feet slash zero point six to one meters high. One hundred and ten to two hundred twenty two pounds. Fifty to one hundred and ten kilograms. That's a big bird. <laughs> well, they were big birds. You know, if you could go back in time. Mm -hmm go back thousands of years before these islands were 
mm -hmm. discovered by humans, mm -hmm. uh, what you would find is the entire island is is birds right because uh, there's no native mammals to, yeah the the to... birds are the the big tall birds are the predators uh you have if you went to hawaii before humans came you would find just birds in every single niche because exactly. they didn't have reptiles and they didn't have mammals uh, well, supplying those uh, new bases. zealand had some reptiles like the tuatara right well, that's true and there was there were a few uh rodents that were native but right. not very many. well like the weta was meant to be like the rodent of new zealand right yeah, that, that giant big, cricket yeah giant cricket yes yeah flightless cricket wingless cricket uh but it yeah. and i think it's, it's because like i've done an episode of the moa before a dinornis with uh actual fellow new zealander ben o'regan <laughs> ah, so he would know more he would uh but this one uh he um uh, this one's a little bit smaller but there were so many different moas and and if you know how ecosystems work, there's like one animal per niche. So even though these are a bunch of large flightless birds, they all had their own niches. That's right. That's so right. to make this ecosystem is of um, – so diet was a herbivore um, based on it, the length of its neck. It probably either brow – it browsed like like medium-sized trees or like low, low ferns or something or grasses. Yeah, and it's also often depicted, I think, to make it look more scary, it's often depicted quite erect. Right. But actually, it walked down much more like a, like an echidna would. Well, yeah. With its head toward the ground, because it was a ground feeder. Most well, then of the what's time. the point of that long neck? Well, probably to one would be for defense or for offense. Oh, well, I guess it's true, kind of looking out like a sentry. <laughs> uh, the other would be to reach things that are tall. Uh, all right. So, uh, time mid Pleistocene to early Holocene, one million to five hundred years ago. <laughs> yes, historical figures from before that time, like William the Conqueror, Mar Marco Polo, Chaucer, and just barely Leonardo da Vinci, were alive at the same time as this thing. Well, and there are people who believe that some Moas are still alive in in very remote places. Well, that. Uh, and mm. and there are some that would date the uh, last appearance as being in the late 1800s. Oh wow! People claim to have seen them. That's that's cool. That'd be nice. Uh, we could definitely bring them back Jurassic Park style. And that is one of the birds that's on the list to uh, nice. bring back. Nice. That'd be nice. That would be nice indeed. I also think it's interesting, like for some of these ones that last that go up to a little bit later in history. I like to compare them like historical events or something that around that time, like mammoths were still around on an island in Siberia. When the pyramids were being built, which is incredible to me. Um, mm. But then, like one time, I did an episode with Stephen on Archaeoindris, which was a giant gorilla sized lemur. It lived in Madagascar and it lived up to 2,000 years ago. Oh, wow. Now, that actually, its extinction had nothing to do with humans because humans arrived on the island, I think, only like 500 years ago. Mm. But 2,000 years ago, that means like the Greek thing, like the Battle of Thermopolis <laughs> or mm. Thermopolis, you know, with the 300 Spartans. Down, down in Madagascar at that time, there were these giant prehistoric lemurs. That's just so crazy thing about how recent some prehistory still is. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. And that movie 300 was so ridiculous. I joked in that episode. It's like the Persians could have had a few of them in their army. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's likely that uh, the Romans killed some in the Colosseum. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny. That movie also has a battle rhino as well as battle elephants. Now, rhinos have never really seen much combat. It's mainly elephants, right? Rhinos are kind of too temperamental, I think I've read. I can't imagine trying to control a rhino. Yeah. Like you can make it do a rampage and hope it gets to the enemy <laughs> doing its rampage. But I feel like. Like even in the movie Three Hundred, one Spartan throws a spear at it, it just goes down immediately. So. Wow, not not likely. Uh, rhinos actually do have armor. That's true. Well, this one was literally armored too by wow. the Persians. So. Well, I can't imagine how a spear would go through that. Uh, the, the, the Spartans were just that, that cool in that movie. Uh, so, location New Zealand, uh, described in eighteen forty six. Pop culture appearances, various documentaries about moas and other birds encountered by the Maori people. Maori people called this one Moa Haka Haka. Um, Maori language is so fun because it reminds me of Bionicle, which used a ton of Maori in the early years, like Toa, Matanui, Tahu, Kanohi. Those are all Maori words that mean literally what the uh, what they're trying to be like. Toa means hero. Um, Kanohi means mask. Um, Tahu means fire. And these are what the characters are. Mm. 
They were inspired a lot by Maori culture. Uh, they veered away from it in later years, though. Apparently, there was a lawsuit where they used a word that was meant to be more holy word, and they used it for the villagers. So they were like, they got in trouble for that. So, yep, that would make sense. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> desecrating language, right? Because like the Matoran used to be called Tohunga, but that's a very holy word in the in the Maori language. So they uh-huh. renamed them to Matoran. And the Tohunga was, was dropped from the canon. So this was this was the most common moa um, found in both the large New Zealand islands as well as the multitude of the smaller surrounding ones. Okay. Uh, and half of all moa eggs in museum collections come from this species. The the average size of the eggs are eight inches slash two hundred five millimeters long and five inches slash one hundred forty five millimeters wide. <laughs> that's, that's a big egg. That's a that big is egg. A big egg. Big egg. And not, not only that, like that's bigger than an ostrich egg, right? Yes, yes, and this is, is not as big as an ostrich. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, probably ostriches lay many eggs. That's Cassowaries true. lay one egg, so it's likely that the moa may have only laid one egg at a time. Right. Well, same with the kiwi. The kiwi yes. lays an egg that's it's a enormous. Third of its- it's enormous. Yes. It seems the evolution of rat. Like I said, they all came from flying ancestors. Um, but like the other moa, it went extinct due to overhunting uh, by the Maori people, which arrived in New Zealand in the 14th century and wiped them out within 200 years. <laughs> so. Uh, so that scene in Sleeping Beauty, when the kings are talking, and that one says, "This is the 14th century." Just know that same time elsewhere, the Maori are slaughtering <laughs> the, the, the Moas. Those fairies should have done something about it. And action is complicity, I say. Humans are not good for anything in the no. environment. No, we're not. Although, okay, look, it depends on the animal, and like, like we've talked about how like cities are their own natural biome now. So animals like rats, <laughs> pigeons, and raccoons, they love us. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's their habitat. Yes. They have evolved. They've, they haven't evolved. They're generalists. And yeah. so they make do with whatever we provide for them. You know, it's interesting to think. So like in terms of technological advancement, there's like, there's like different theories about technological advancement of humanity. And one of the ones, particularly if it turns out that the, that the, uh, the distance of space travel the distance of space travel might be too much for us to deal with or too impractical. That So we stay on Earth and we stay on Earth in a few other places. There could be a point where of technological stagnation. So where we just – we get to this really advanced period and then we just stop possibly. I mean I don't see that happening based on other stuff. But, but if that happens and that happens for long enough – Imagine the animals that could evolve in those cities. Oh, that's a good point. If the cities stay that way in technological stages for millions of years. Right, which I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine either. Humans like to push the boundaries. Yep. But that'd be an interesting thing to think about. Like yep. the city animals that is because you're right, the ones that are in the cities, they didn't evolve that way. They just happened to be good for that way. Um and and these were not good for that way. These uh Eurip- Eurip-teric. I keep wanting to say Eurypterids, but that's a completely different animal that's much grosser and scarier. It's claw your animal. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the Great Moa is uh, – this isn't the Great Moa. It's the smaller Moa, but just as uh, just as interesting, I say. And yeah, 3.3 feet doesn't seem that impressive. Isn't that – a cassowary is not like six feet. It's like four feet, right? Where's yeah. a cassowary like six yeah, feet? Yeah, four feet. Yeah, so that's still impressive. This would not be nearly as dangerous, I don't think. Because it couldn't run as fast. <laughs> we we don't think it We'd, could, but what if it did? Well, I guess that's true. You know what? I mean, I've seen the pictures of the, of the giant moas. It looks like that you could it could potentially kick your stomach straight out of your mouth like a soccer ball. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, so, they're just enormous feet. Just boom. How did the Maoris kill it? I don't know. I guess they were hungry. But... Um, Maori people like the like 14th century. That was late in the Maori um, group because Maori but people have been around for thousands of years. I wonder why they, they're from Polynesia though. So, but then they made it all the way to Hawaii. So I don't I don't know. Like, I just feel like that took them a long time to get to New Zealand. Then <laughs> why did it take them so long to get to New Zealand? <laughs> the Maori probably because the currents aren't right for it. They got to Hawaii though. But I guess the currents might be better for <laughs> yeah. The currents were better for that. Well, it's funny because like if you look at like the people throughout history and geographically, um, you'd think that the first people that made it to Madagascar would be the native Africans. It wasn't. It was the Polynesians. Yep. <laughs> they went across the Indian Ocean to get to it yep. rather than going straight from Africa. <laughs> yep. So that's, that's – It was really the way the currents went. That makes sense. There was a book written called Contiki about how uh, the people in Polynesia might have traveled and they built the, the boat exactly – 
uh, like it would have been in Polynesian times. And then the people got on it and just let it drift and see where it took them. Uh, I guess that makes sense. That's true. Cause I've never really seen, Poly- I mean, some of them have, you know, sometimes they use paddles. Most of them just use the sails and just, and just use the currents and use the, of the o- wind and the ocean. Yeah. Yep. They well, were, if they had no idea where they were going, the sails wouldn't be that useful. I guess they that's true. They would basically let the current take them. That's true. I guess they could control yeah, where the sails were. I just, I'll, I'll, most of my Maori knowledge either comes from Bionicle or Moana, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> both. Both very good references. Yeah, both very classic documentaries about. Yeah. Speaking of which, of Toa, remember that crab was called Tamatoa? So that's yep. how you can tell the different the, the similarities. Yep. Also, Mo, Mo, Moana's island was called Moto Nui. <laughs> True. So, like Mata, they're, they're the same thing. Anyways, all right, let's rate uh, the uh, broad build boa one out of 65 million. I'm going to rate it like uh, 40 million because it's not as cool as the big ones, but it's, I guess it's pretty neat still. Well, wait a minute. Let's listen to what it sounds like. And okay. You might just change your mind. Okay. How, wait, how do we know what it sounds Here is the moa, or at least a recreation of what you might have heard in the New Zealand bush long ago. This is courtesy of the papa. It sounds like a cow. <laughs> Actually, it sounds like one of those Star Wars creatures. It sounds like something getting ready to explode. You, you know, like those weird alien creatures at the Gungans Road in Phantom Menace? It sounds like one of those. <laughs> uh, it's using its throat, its, its syrinx to make this sound, if it has one, and I'm guessing it had a syrinx. Well, that's, that's what <clears throat> parrots talk through that. They don't have vocal cords like we do, but somehow they're able to emulate human speech. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I guess I've, I've upped my aunt, my rating to fifty million because that's freaking terrifying. I think it's pretty terrifying. I'm going to say fifty five million. Fifty five million. Got it. Cool. All right. Well, that's it for this week. If you want to get a hold of the show, you can contact me at Paleobites Podcast at gmail dot com. Paleobites Pod on Twitter and Paleobites Podcast on Instagram. You can follow me, find me on so, pretty person on social media at Matthew Dollar Creator on Facebook and Matthew Dollar Sixty Four everywhere else. So like Instagram uh, and Twitter and TikTok. <laughs> um, I have a book series on Amazon Megazoic available for print and Kindle. Uh, no, you're a rhetoric sentence because it's too late uh, in the timeline for when those books take place. It'd be and too early in the timeline for my books, Tesla knots. <laughs> so maybe if I get around to writing a medieval book or something or a Ma- or Maori book. Uh, all right. Well, that's it for this week. I say the end of every episode of Paleo Bites. All right, it was like, you going to play it again. I do not know how the Maori didn't hear that and immediately hightail it back to the fil- to Polynesian. The Polynesian. Imagine what the jungles were like with these sounds. Oh my goodness! And there were many different species of moa, so they would have all had their own. I know, like calls. The, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> all right. Well, bye, listeners.